Hello there, I'm your imaginary friend. Uh, today I have another story for you by Guy de Maupassant. And I was always bear in mind that sometimes an author will have included something in their work that at the time of writing seemed fine to them, and it's not always fine. Uh, periodically I feel it necessary as a friend, imaginary or otherwise, to, to, uh, to add on to that warning a little bit. And in this case, um, this story is disturbing. <laughs> If you're not braced for that, maybe come back. This is the diary of a madman. He died a high court judge, an honest and incorruptible magistrate whose impeccable life was held up as an example in every court in France. Senior barristers, junior counsel, even judges used to bow very low as a token of profound respect every time they saw his imposing pale thin face which was illumined by two bright, deep-set eyes. He'd spent the whole of his life in bringing criminals to justice and in protecting the rights of the weak and innocent. Crooks and murderers had never known a more redoubtable enemy, for it seemed as though he could penetrate deep into their souls, read their innermost thoughts, and unravel at a single glance the mysterious secrets of mind and will. Well, now he was dead. At the age of eighty-two, showered with praise and honor and mourned by the whole nation. Smart soldiers in red breeches had escorted him to the tomb, and men in white cravats had sprinkled upon his coffin words of grief and tears of sorrow which seemed absolutely genuine. Now, here is the strange document discovered by an astonished solicitor in the desk where this judge locked away his dossiers on all the great criminals. It is entitled Why, and is reproduced as follows. 20th June, 1851. <clears throat> Just left the court. I have condemned Blondel to death. Why did this man kill his five children? Why? So often one comes across these people for whom the destruction of life is a, a physical pleasure. Yes, yes, it must be a, a pleasure, perhaps the greatest thrill of all. For is not murder the act which bears the closest resemblance to creation? Create and destroy? These two words sum up the history of every universe, the history of every world that ever was, of everything that exists. Everything. Why is it so exhilarating to kill? 25th June. To think that a living being is there, a being which exists, which walks and runs. A being. What is a being? It is no more than an animated thing which carries within it the principle of movement, and a will which controls this movement. It has no connection with anything, this being. His very feet have no relationship to the ground they touch. It's simply a speck of life moving on the surface of the earth. I have no idea how this speck of life came to be here, but it can be destroyed in all kinds of ways. And there's nothing, nothing at all. Just putrefaction, and then it's all over. 26th June. So why is it a crime to kill? Yes, why? Far from being a crime, it is the law of nature. Every creature is destined to kill. It kills in order to live, and it kills for the sake of killing. Killing is in our nature. We simply have to kill. Animals kill continuously, all day long, every moment of their existence. Man kills continuously in order to feed himself. But as he also experiences the necessity to kill for sheer pleasure, he's invented the sport of hunting. A child will kill the insects he finds, or small birds, or any little creature he happens to get his hands on. But none of this could satisfy the overwhelming need to murder which lies within us. It's not enough to kill animals. We also experience a need to kill human beings. In olden times, this need was fulfilled by human sacrifices. To today, the necessity of living in society has turned homicide into a crime. We condemn and punish the murderer. But because we cannot live without yielding to this natural overmastering instinct to kill, we... We obtain relief every now and then by means of wars, in which a whole nation slaughters another nation. 
Then we have a real orgy in the blood, a drunken orgy, which sends armies wild and intoxicates even respectable citizens and women folk, even the children who read in the evening lamplight the thrilling stories of a massacre. And you might imagine that people would despise those who have the task of butchering human beings. Not a bit of it. Honors are heaped upon them. They are attired in gold and resplendent garments. They wear plumes on their heads, decorations on their chests. And they are presented with crosses, awards, and titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, acclaimed by the crowds. And all this simply because they are men dedicated to the task of shedding human blood. They parade through the streets with their instruments of death, which the drably clothed passers-by look upon with envy. For slaughter is the one great law implanted by nature at the very core of existence. There is nothing more glorious or more honourable than killing. 30th June Killing is decreed by law, but nature loves eternal youth. Whatever she does, however unconscious and unfeeling the act, she seems to cry out, quick, quick, quick. And the more she destroys, the more she's renewed. Second July. A human being. What is a human being? Everything and nothing. Through the power of thought, it can mirror everything it experiences. Through memory and knowledge, it becomes a microcosm, carrying the world within itself. A mirror of things, a mirror of facts. Each human being becomes a little universe within the universe. But do some traveling. Consider the teeming populations of the earth. A man becomes nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing. Get on board a ship, sail away from the crowds upon the shore, and soon you'll see nothing but the coastline. The microscopic human being simply disappears. He's so tiny, so insignificant. Or take an express train and make a journey through Europe. Look out of the carriage window and you'll see people, people, always people, so many, they cannot be counted. And all utter strangers swarming in the fields, swarming in the streets. You see stupid peasants who only know how to till the ground. You see ugly women who only know how to cook for their menfolk and bear children. Go to India, go to China. You will see yet more teeming billions who live and die without leaving behind them any more sign of their existence than would an ant squashed underfoot. Go to the countries inhabited by the blacks who live in mud huts, or to the countries inhabited by the Arabs who shelter under brown canvas flapping in the wind, and then you will understand that the isolated individual human being is nothing, absolutely nothing. Yes, travel around the world. And look at the teeming masses of countless anonymous human beings. Did I say anonymous? Ah, there's the key to the whole problem. Murder is a crime only because we've put labels on human beings. As soon as they are born, we register them, give them names, have them baptized. The law takes them over, and there we are. But the human being who is not registered counts for nothing. Kill him on the moors, or in the desert, kill him in the mountains, or on the open plain. And what does it matter? Nature delights in death. She never punishes a murderer. As an example of what is really sacred, take the official register of births, marriages, and deaths. This is the thing which defends the human race. The life of an individual is only sacred so long as his name has been registered. Show your respect for the register of births, marriages, and deaths, down on your knees. Oh yes, the state can kill, because it has the right to change the official register. When it is attended to the slaughter of 200,000 men in a war, it crosses out their names in the register. It arranges for the registrar to annihilate them with the stroke of his pen. And that is all there is to it. But we, who cannot change what is inscribed in the town hall, must respect life. A register of births, marriages, and deaths, glorious goddess enthroned in the temples of our town councils, I salute you. You are stronger than nature. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. 3rd July. 
It must be a peculiarly delicious pleasure to kill someone, to have there just in front of you a living, thinking human being, and then to make a little hole in him, just a little hole, and to see that red life-giving stuff we call blood flow out of the hole, and to end up with nothing in front of you but a heap of cold, limp, lifeless flesh, incapable of thought. 5th August. What if I, I who have spent my life passing judgment, condemning people to death, killing people by the mere utterance of a few words, killing by the guillotine those who had killed by the knife, what if I, yes, what if I were to act in the same way as the murderers I have condemned? If I were to do it, who would know? 10th August. <clears throat> yes, who would ever know? Would anybody ever suspect me? Especially if I choose a victim that I have no particular reason to want out of the way? 15th August. Temptation? Ah, oh, temptation has eaten into me like some loathsome grub crawling about inside me. It crawls around my whole body. It crawls into my mind, which can now only think one single thought. I must kill it crawls into my eyes, which are eager to see the shedding of blood, eager to witness death. It crawls into my ears, which constantly hear the echo of something mysterious, horrible, heart-rending, unnerving. The victim's last cry. It crawls through my legs, with tremble with eagerness to go, to go to the place where the thing will happen. It crawls through my fingers, which quiver with the intensity the desire to kill. How enjoyable this experience must be. How rare. An experience worthy of a free man. A man a cut above his fellows. A man who is master of his feelings. And yet who is seeking an exquisite new sensation. 22nd August. I could resist it no longer. I've killed a small creature just as an experiment, just to make a start. My valet Jean kept a goldfinch in a cage hanging by the pantry window. I sent him off on an errand, and then I took the tiny bird in my hand. In the palm of my hand, I could feel its heart beating, and I could feel the warmth of its body. I went up to my bedroom. Every now and then I squeezed it more tightly. I could feel its heart beat faster. The experience was atrocious. Delightful. I nearly squeezed the life out of it, but if I had done that, I would not have seen blood. So I picked up some scissors, small nail scissors, and cut open the bird's little throat in three snips ever so gently. It opened its beak, struggled to get away from me, but I held it firm. Oh, yes, I held it all right. I felt so strong, I could have held a mad dog. And I saw the blood flow. How beautiful it is. Red, glistening, brilliant blood. It was so beautiful that I wanted to drink it. I tasted it on the tip of my tongue. Delicious. But there was so little of it in this poor, tiny bird. I did not have time to feast my eyes on this sight as much as I would have liked. Ah, what a wonderful thing it must be to see a bull bleed to death. Next I did what murderers usually do, real murderers. I washed the scissors, I washed my hands, threw away the blood-stained water. Then I took the body, the little bird's corpse, down into the garden in order to bury it. I dug a hole under a strawberry plant and buried it there. Nobody would find it. Every day I shall eat a strawberry from this plant. Really what enjoyment you can get out of life, once you know how. My servant has been weeping. He thinks his bird escaped from the cage and flew away. How could he possibly suspect me? <laughs> 25th August. I must kill a human being. I must. 30th August. I've done it. How easy it was. I'd set out to walk through the Bois de Varn. I had no thought of murder in mind, no, nothing like that. And I saw a child walking along the woodland path. A little boy was eating a sandwich. 
He stood still to watch me go by, and as I passed, he said, Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. And a thought suddenly entered my head. What if I were to kill him? Are you all by yourself, child? I asked. Yes, Monsieur. All on your own, in this wood? Yes, Monsieur. The desire to kill him flooded through me, intoxicating me like wine. I went up to him very gently, convinced that he would run away. And suddenly I found my fingers and his throat. I squeezed and squeezed as hard as I could. He stared at me with terrifying eyes. Oh, those eyes, so round, so intense, so crystal clear, so terrible. I have never experienced such a feeling of brutality. But it was all over so quickly. He clung to my wrists with his little hands, and his body writhed and squirmed, just like a feather does, and throw it on the fire. My heart was beating madly. It reminded me of the goldfinch's heart. I threw the body into a ditch and covered it with grass. I came back home and had a good dinner. How easy it was. This evening I'd been very cheerful, very light-hearted, as though rejuvenated. I spent the evening with the chief of police. Everybody thought I was very witty. But I've not yet seen human blood. I shall have no peace till I do. 31st August. The body's been discovered. They're looking for the murderer. <laughs> 1st September. Two tramps have been arrested. But there's no evidence against them. 2nd September. The little boy's parents have been to see me. They were in tears. <laughs> 6th October. The case is still unsolved. It is presumed the crime was committed by some vagrant. Oh, if only I'd seen his blood flow. How much easier in my mind I should be. 18th October. The lust to kill thrills me to the very marrow. It's comparable to one of those passionate love affairs which torment you at the age of twenty. 20th October. I've done it again. After breakfast, I went for a walk along the river. I passed a fisherman asleep under a willow tree. It was about twelve o'clock. In a potato field close to the river, there was a spade which had been left stuck into the ground. It was as though... They have been put there on purpose. I took hold of it, retraced my steps, then I raised the spade above my head like an axe, and with a single blow from the sharp edge I split the fisherman's head in two. Oh, now this one really did bleed. Lots and lots of blood, quite pink, all mingled with brain. It slithered into the water ever so gently, and I walked away with slow and solemn tread. If only they could have seen me. I would have made a first-rate murderer. 25th October. The case of the murdered fisherman is causing a great stir. His nephew, who had gone fishing with him, has been accused of the crime. 26th October. The examining magistrate confirms that the nephew is guilty. Everybody in town believes it. <laughs> 27th October. The nephew is putting up a very weak defence. He has stated that he had gone to the village to buy some bread and cheese. He swears that his uncle was killed during the time he was absent. Who's going to believe his story? 28th October. They have got him into such a state that the nephew has almost confessed he did it. Ah! Justice! Justice! 15th November. They now have overwhelming evidence against the nephew. It has been discovered that he was to inherit his uncle's estate. I shall be the presiding judge of the assizes. 25th January. To death! To death! To death! I've had him contempt to death! <laughs> the prosecuting counsel spoke with the eloquence of an angel. <laughs> so I've another one to my credit. I shall go and see him executed. 18th March. It's all over. 
He was guillotined this morning. It was a lovely death. Quite lovely. A pleasure to watch. How splendid it is to see a man's head sliced from his body. The blood gushed out in a great flood. A great flood. Oh, if only I could have taken a bath in it. How exhilarating it would have been to lie under the guillotine and feel all that blood running through my hair, streaming down my face. And to get up again, covered in red, covered in red. Ah, if only I knew just what it was like. For the present, I shall wait. I can afford to wait. It would only need one little slip, and I should be found out. There were many more pages in the diary, but none of them described any further crime. The psychiatrists who are now studying this manuscript say that there are many unsuspected madmen at large, just as clever and terrifying as this monstrous mania. 